you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 tonight in God's Word. By way of uh, uh, illustration, uh, I came across a, a bunch of articles as I was uh, working on this sermon, putting it together. And uh, really the, the articles were talking about a number of different things when it comes to the state of the United States right now, people's uh, uh, emotions and things that are going on. And let me read to you. It says, uh, it's, be it's being called an epidemic. Recent surveys uh, show that around 60% of people in the U.S. right now report feeling lonely on a regular basis. According to a new advisory put out by the Surgeon General's office, the epidemic of loneliness in the United States due to the lack of human connection can increase uh, the risk of premature death levels comparable to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. One doctor said, you can feel lonely even if you have a lot of people around you because loneliness is about the quality of your connections. This doctor went on to recommend that people go back to church so that they can connect with God and other people. I don't even know, when the Surgeon General is recommending that you go back to church, <laughs> there's something going on, right? But I say that to, to uh, lay, the, lay this foundation tonight, is that it's critical that we connect with Jesus first and along with other people who will help build us up. I want you to think with me about Jesus is enough out of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to just read one scripture tonight, verse 9. The Word of God says this, And God said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most uh, gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Amen. I want you to think with me, first of all, tonight about the tendency to isolate when weak. Now, in our text, Paul says that Christ's strength is made perfect when we are weak. Paul is not giving a free pass to, to, uh, you know, to sin and get involved with sinful lifestyles, but he's addressing the fact that there is a real struggle with things, and struggle is a very real human experience, right? Temptation, failure, mistakes. Listen, tonight, it is possible to struggle with faith due to trials and sickness. It is possible to not have boldness or confidence. It is possible because of poor self-worth and self-image to draw back. It is possible to be filled with anger, sadness, depression, and even fear. It's possible to deal with any or all of those things, but yet still not fall into sin. I mean, you know, we can deal with those things in life and still not be totally overcome by sin or give in to that lower nature. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, we read that temptation is common to man, but God is faithful and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So we must understand that weakness does not mean that we're bad Christians or bad people. Just because we're struggling with something, that doesn't mean we're horrible. Amen? But the devil wants us to believe that. We'd be foolish to think that the devil does not use our weaknesses to attack us, to condemn us for struggling with things. Listen, the devil will make you sick, and then he'll tell you that you have no faith because you're sick. He's, a, he's a, 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 a manipulator. He's, he's uh, just trying to rip people off and destroy our ability to trust God. A recent study put out by the University of Chicago, it shows that when people feel weak or insecure, they tend to isolate themselves. And that isolation makes the mind and body feel more vulnerable uh, leading to an elevated, uh, elevated stress hormones, high blood pressure, poor sleep, 
And in turn, that leads to further isolation. So the, listen, the devil's a master at trying to draw people away so that we're on our own, by ourselves, isolated, so then he can just attack us and we don't have any way to defend ourselves. Listen, even in times of profound sadness or grief, people will struggle with things like, does God hear my cries? Will God, will God draw near to me? Will God help me? Or that three-letter word that is so common when people are going through things. People say, why? And we'll get hung up. If we're not careful, we can get hung up. And simply put, God does hear. God does draw near. And the answer to the question why is always because we live in a fallen world. Why did that happen? Why did so-and-so have to die so young? Why did this thing, bad, tragic thing happen? Why am I battling or dealing with this? Why, why, why? Is God near? Is God here? Does God hear? Yes, yes, yes. But we live in a fallen world. Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, it says, But go and learn what this means. Jesus is telling the disciples this. He said, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, the day that you got saved, the day that you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you became a Christian. You were forgiven of your sins. Can you say amen? But 10, 15, 20 years down the road, you're not any more saved than you were the day that you gave your life to Jesus. You're still just as saved. The difference is, is that you've been more removed. Hopefully you've uh, you know, stopped doing the sinful things that caused you guilt and shame. And over the course of time, because you're more removed from those sinful things, that guilt and shame, those feelings, don't have its same power over our lives. So it's not that we're more saved 10 years from now. It's just that we're more removed from that person who we used to be. And if we're not careful, we can think if we're battling with things, and I'm, I'm just not right. I'm, I'm, I'm not good enough. Why isn't things changing? Why isn't my life getting easier? Listen, we live in a broken world filled with sin. And listen, Jesus knows what we're battling. He didn't come to help and save perfect people. Amen? It says right there, He came to call sinners to repentance. So we're not any more saved 10 years from now, and we're not any less of a sinner, a sinner 10 years from now, right? We still need Jesus, and we still need to be transformed more and more and more as we serve God. So this brings us secondly, God wants love and not perfection. Amen? God doesn't expect us to be perfect. Not everything in life is going to be perfect. We must leave room in our lives for grace to do its work. I mean, no, we need to be gracious with other people, and we need to be gracious with ourselves. Sometimes God could be extending mercy again and again, but yet we are condemning ourselves again and again. God wants us to walk in freedom, but we are wrapped up in the turmoil of self-hate, condemnation, self-righteousness. Listen, God doesn't want perfection. He wants us to love Him, and He wants us to walk in that love. In our text, Paul, he said, I would rather boast in my infirmities. So Paul is saying, hey, I have weaknesses, and that's okay. I have struggles, and that's okay. I'd rather say I have problems and I have struggles than to walk around and say I'm perfect. Because in my weaknesses, in my infirmities, the power of Christ rests upon me. So what he's bringing us into, Paul is trying to convey that our weaknesses actually magnify God's goodness and God's strength when He gets involved in our lives and changes things for the good. When we are at the end of ourselves and we say, honestly, I can't 
Take another step. I can't change this. I can't go any further. God, I prayed all the prayers I could pray. I mean, ever been there before where it's like, man, God, God, I've prayed and I've repented and I've asked and, and what else do you need me to do? I can't do anything else. And Paul says it's right there. That's when God's power kicks in. That's when God says, okay, you're not enough, but I am. Your strength is not the strength that needs to be engaged right. My strength is what needs to kick in right now. My power is what needs to be at work right now. And you know what? Paul says that he wants the power of God to rest upon him. Paul had a revelation. Paul said, he he came to the point where he realized, you know what, I'm never going to be good enough. But God is good enough. I'm never going to be strong enough, but Jesus is strong enough. And he's going to help me when I can't help myself. When Jesus heals, when he redeems areas of our lives that we've tried to prop up by our own ideas. Have you ever been there before? I know how I'm going to fix this. I know how I'm going to make it better. And then we make it worse, right? It just blows up in our face. And we got a small fire and then we pour gasoline on it, right? It's like... Okay, now I need five fire trucks to put this one out. Right? I had a little disagreement with my wife, and now I'm sleeping in the car. Okay, that didn't work out the way I thought it was. But that's what happens when our own strength is at work, when we prop things up. Listen, when we see God change things that we can't change ourselves, It strengthens our faith, and it demonstrates God's active involvement in our life. It builds us up, and we see, God, you care. God, you're helping me. God, you're changing things that I can't change. In Isaiah 64, verse 6, it says, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. You see, God is not going to force you to admit that you are tired and weary. That your way of approaching life is not working. God's not going to force that on you. But listen, you cannot clean something with a filthy rag. You're just going to smear dirt around. You're not actually going to take the dirt away. Right? But God will let you come to the end of yourself. God will let you smear the dirt around with that filthy rag just so that you realize something needs to change here. My own goodness, my own filthiness is not cleaning things up. I need a power that's greater than me to come in and help change things. In Matthew 14, we read that the disciples, they were crossing the lake. And as they're out there in the lake, they're rowing, the wind is blowing, the waves are tossing them around. And as they're there, you know, going through all of these motions, fighting, 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 here comes Jesus walking on the water towards them. Peter recognizes him and says, If it's you, Lord, bid me to come on the water. Now listen, Peter wasn't a perfect man. Peter had anger issues. Peter struggled with pride and fear. We can see that in the stories about his life, right? We see that he had a short fuse. He was a hot-tempered man. And he wanted to be right there with Jesus all the time. I want to be in charge of things. So there was all sorts of things that were there. And then as Jesus is arrested, Peter's by the fire, and he's rejecting and denying Jesus out of fear. So we know that he had some real heart issues. He wasn't a perfect person. But even with all of those flaws, his faith and trust in Jesus Christ were all that he needed to step out of the boat and stand on the sea. There's not one other person in the world that can say, I walked on water to Jesus. Only Peter, right? Think about that. His faith in Jesus was all he needed to step out of the boat and walk on the water. But think about what happens is as he walks to Jesus, as he's keeping his eyes on Christ, he's 
walking in victory. He's walking on water. He's walking in the miraculous. But the moment he takes his eyes off of Jesus, he begins to sink. In Matthew 14, 31, excuse me, 30 and 31, it says, But when Peter saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. You know what's amazing about this story is what happened to Peter happens to every Christian. It happens to every one of our lives. When we turn our focus on the issues that we're facing, when we allow feelings and emotions to overshadow and supersede our revelation of who Jesus is, we will begin to sink and drown in things that we can never control. I mean, oh, Peter couldn't control the sea. Peter couldn't control the water. But as long as he put his eyes on Jesus, he overcame. As long as he put his eyes in faith and trust in Christ, he rose above. He was walking in a miracle. Now, if you read that whole story, the wind and the waves were actually there before Jesus was. Jesus was praying. And they're out there rowing, and the wind and the waves were coming. So it's not like the conditions changed. It's not like Peter stepped out, and it was a nice, beautiful, sunny day, and as he was walking to Jesus, boom, the storm hits, right? No. When he stepped out of the boat, the wind was there, the waves were there, everything was already in craziness and chaos. The difference was is that he had his eyes on Jesus. The moment he took his attention off of truth, the moment he took his attention off of Jesus Christ and placed it in himself again. I mean, oh, if you're going to look at your problems that you can't change, that you can't do anything about, you're going to focus on that, you're going to start to drown in it. What changed was where he placed his trust. Tonight, do you believe that you can trust God? Do you believe that God is worthy enough of your trust? Do you believe that Christ can be enough no matter what happens in your life? Listen, Peter's condition didn't change, right? There was still trouble. There was chaos. The difference was he trusted. And then he didn't trust. He walked on the water, and he began to drown. You know, tonight, the difference is the same for every one of us. Where are we putting our trust? Where are we putting our focus? Remember, God doesn't want perfection. Peter wasn't perfect. We don't need to be perfect. We'll never be perfect. But we can trust. We can say, I believe. God, you're greater than what I'm facing. God, you're bigger than the storm. God, you're bigger than the winds that are blowing against my life. God, I believe you. And I trust you. And you know what? That's enough. Let's close with what happens when Christ is enough. Billy Graham, he said, God made us for one reason, so that He could have fellowship with us. It wasn't that He was lonely or needed us, but He made us in His image so that He could shower His love upon us. Listen, God made us so that we could know His love. God made us so that we could live free. In our text, Paul writes, God's strength is made perfect in our weakness, that the power of Christ may rest upon us. Listen, God's okay with our weakness because He wants to pour out His power on us. He wants to help us right where we're at. You know, this, this evening when we realize that Christ is all that we will ever need, and all that we have ever needed, then we will begin to tap into what the love of God is really all about. It's at that point that we will begin to realize what God really wants for our lives and has for our lives. 2 Peter 1.3, God's divine power has, give, has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. God's power is available to give us everything we will ever need. 
Not only does Christ offer everything that we will ever need to get or to stay connected to God, but He also gives us what we need to function in our daily lives. Philippians 4 uh, verse 19, we use this in the offering, but God shall supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You know, for some people, the wind and the wave comes in the, in the form of bills, late payments, eviction notices, time off that you don't, didn't need. It comes in the form of reversals financially, sickness, things like that. There are things that will come against our lives but listen, God says, listen, I will supply your need according to my riches. Not the world's, but according to mine. Um, you know, God uses the things of the world to bless us, but, but that's not what we need to be living for. God wants us to walk in victory because, simply because He loves us. It's, it's, and it's so much bigger than just functioning and getting by. God doesn't just want us to scrape by, right? Have you ever felt like that before? Like, I made it through another day. <laughs> just, just barely. 20 more minutes, man, and we're, we're out of work. 20 more minutes, we're out of school. Like, if I could just get through this day. Listen, God doesn't want us to live that way. He wants us to have victory constantly through our days. Yes, we will struggle, but yes, there is something so much bigger. And the bigger picture that you and I need to get is connected to that love of God. In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, it says, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, listen to this, may have an abundance for every good work. There is a purpose why God wants to pour out His love on you. There is a purpose why God wants to move in your life. There is a purpose why God wants to give you victory over the things that you struggle with. And that purpose is so that every good work can be accomplished in your life. Now we're talking about destiny. When we're talking about the good things that God has for us, the, the things that God has planned for us, we are talking about destiny, the big picture of your life, why you were born, why you are here tonight. God has plans for you that are far greater than any of us can imagine. God has plans for you that, that far exceed what even your dreams for your life are. I'm talking about your life being connected with something that is far greater than you. I'll never forget the very first time I went to Bible conference. I walked into the tent and I'm looking around and I'm like, wow, this is, this is epic, man. You know, I was just young, 21 years old. Had my whole life ahead of me, but didn't really have a focus or a direction yet. Was still kind of trying to figure things out. And that night when I came into the tent, and I'm surrounded by people from all around the world, we begin to worship God together, we begin to sing, we begin to praise God. And I'm like, I stopped. I got choked up. God, is this what heaven's going to be like? Is this what it's going to be like? There's no color. There's no language. There's no anger. There's no frustration. There's none of that. We're just worshiping Jesus. But you know what I got a bigger picture of? God, you made me a part of something that is way, way bigger than me. God, you put me in something that's touching the world. You placed me in a body that I could make a difference in, that I could be a part of. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Listen, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you become a son or a daughter of Christ. You have become a part of something that is worth living for. Amen? When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you become a part of something that is worth dying for. And that is the kingdom of God. Your life takes on a whole different direction when you catch a revelation of why Jesus called you out of the world. 
Why Jesus picked you up out of the miry pit, the brokenness and the hurt and the shame that was so uh, destroying your life. God said, come here, I'm going to pick you up out of that because I want to make you a part of something that's bigger than you. You know, God says, I chose you. You didn't choose me. You didn't choose me. And God says, I know who you are, and I'm going to choose you because I have a plan for your life. I pick you. I want you to be a part of this. I have a plan, a place for you in the body of believers. I want you to do something for me. Jesus saves us, cleans us, heals us so that our lives can be used to their full potential. Listen, when you're on the end of a bottle, when you're sucking on the end of a pipe, when you're looking in the mirror filled with shame and guilt, when you're flipping through the internet looking at filthy things, that's not your potential. That's the, that's the brokenness. That's the hurt, that's the shame that the devil offers. That's the counterfeit. But when you start to serve Jesus, when you start to step out in faith and say, God, this is making me uncomfortable, but I don't care, I'm going to do it anyways, because it's what you're asking me to do. God, I'm going to tell that person about the love of God because you want me to. When you're, when you're standing there and you're leading someone in a sinner's prayer, when you're praying for somebody that's sick or has an injury and you're seeing them recover, listen, every single person in here, if you're saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, you can pray for people. You can see people saved, healed, delivered, and set free by your prayers. God wants you to do that. It's not just the pastor's call. It's every Christian's call. God wants us to do that. In Joshua, I'm sorry, I jumped here. God wants you to live to your full potential. You know, tonight, there's a, a couple of questions. Do you believe God? Do you believe that He can use you? Do you believe He's real? Can you trust Him? But then another question is how many of you want your life to make a difference? How many of you want your life to make real impact? To, to, to touch people? To bring a change in somebody else's life that they can't bring on their own? They're, they're lost, you know, there are lost, broken, hurting people out there and we have the answer, amen? We have the truth. We have the hope that they need. But they need us to take it to them. How many of you want to be a part of that? You see, that impact happens when we move with and flow with God. When we get connected to what God has for us, that's when our life makes a difference. That's when our life takes on momentum. That's when we realize, this is what I was born for. I'm here for this, and I'm willing to die for this because there's nothing more important in the world than to be where God wants me to be, doing what God wants me to do. Think about Joshua, Joshua chapter 1. They were standing at the doorstep of the promised land, and God tells Joshua, this is what your life is all about. I want you to bring my people into the promised land. I mean, you know, Moses, because of his temper, he did some things, he made some mistakes, and God said, nope, you can't. It's not for you anymore. And he came and he tapped Joshua on the shoulder. I want you to lead my people into destiny. I want you to lead my people into blessing. I want you to take these people into a place where they belong, where I want them to be. Now, we're not all called to be, you know, pastors and what have you, and that's, but we're, we're all called to lead in our homes, in our communities, in our churches, in some degree. Amen? And we're all called to make an impact right where we're at. But listen, it's going to be us connecting with God. God told Joshua, this is what I want you to do, but you're going to have to trust. You're going to have to be strong. 
But then he tells Joshua, you're not going to be alone. Why did I start with loneliness? It's because a lot of times we draw back from what God wants us to do because we're afraid that we're going to have to do it alone. We're going to have to do this by our own power, by our own strength, by our own abilities. Now listen, that's where it's completely different from the world. You go into a job interview and it's all about you, right? You're selling yourself. But when you're, when you're doing something for Jesus, it's not about you. It's about Jesus. It's about God. In Joshua 1 verse 9, God tells Joshua, I, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So God's telling Joshua, it doesn't matter. Everywhere your foot steps, I'm with you. Every struggle that you face, I'm with you. Every battle, every mountain, every valley, every river you're going to have to cross, every trial, I am with you. Be strong and of good courage. Because I'm there with you. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to draw back. You don't have to do this on your own. When we realize that loneliness and isolation are a product of us drawing back, and because of that, things that we struggle with, when we realize that all of those things are because we allow sickness, poor self-worth, poor self-image, anger, sadness, depression, and fear to get in front of our view and our eyes of God. Like, we're looking at Jesus, but then we allow those things to get in front. When we realize that all of those things are a product of us pulling back and drawing away from God, man, I hope that we'd be able to say, you know what? I'm going to press through that. Instead of pulling back, I'm going to move beyond that. I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be courageous. Because I'm not alone. Because God is with me. You know, when we can capture the revelation that we find in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When we can capture that revelation, our whole outlook on what we are facing is going to change. Because we're going to realize it's less about us and more about Jesus. More about what He can do through us. Romans 1.8 There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Listen, it blesses God when we are blessed. It brings God joy to His heart when we walk in victory. Can you say amen? Listen to Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love, and He will rejoice over you with singing. So what Zephaniah is saying is that when God gets involved, and you have the victory, He rejoices, man. He, he, he praises when you overcome, when you make right decisions, when you have victories in your life. God says He's singing and rejoicing over you. I want you to know that you're not alone. I want you to know that you are loved. I want you to know that you have a tremendous future in Jesus Christ. Tonight, if you will walk in the power of the living God, no matter what it is that you're dealing with, no matter what weakness you might think that you have and can't overcome, if you will continue in Christ, if you will not give up, if you will continue to walk forward in Jesus, not only will you be victorious, but you will impact people's lives in ways that you never, ever, ever imagined. God will use you powerfully. Nathan, will you go to the next, as I close with this. This is Pastor Harold Warner. Pastor Harold Warner was saved in 1970. He was uh, called to go and pioneer a small church in, I believe it's Kearney, Arizona. And uh, he went in there and he preached and did some things. And the people of that congregation were like, whoa, this guy's too radical. He's actually saved. We don't want him as our pastor. They told him to pack up his stuff and go back to Prescott. So he did. Packed up his stuff, threw it in his car. Him and his, a few of the men that were there with him that went 
uh, were driving down the road and they hit a patch of ice. The car lost control. They went over an embankment, tumbled, and he was paralyzed. He broke his, his vertebrae. And from that point on, he was paralyzed from the waist down. You want to work for God. Why? Step down in faith. Being obedient. Why? How could that happen? Who does that? Why would you allow that, God? I, the, Pastor Harold Warner could have asked. He probably asked some of those questions, but he answered correctly again and again and again. His answer was always, you know what? I'm facing difficulty. I have a debilitating injury. This would cause most people to be angry at God. This would cause most people to quit. But Pastor Warner had such a love for God. He knew God was in control, and he knew God loved him. He knew God called him. He did not waver when it came to God. He trusted. He pressed forward. And for the last 50 years, he recovered from that, and he was asked to go and take the church in Tucson, Arizona, Small, struggling church about ready to close. Him and his wife, Mona, that's them. Picture of them when they left to go to the Tucson church. And this is a recent picture of them over here in the, the far uh, right corner there. For 50 years, they've pastored the Tucson church. Listen to this. It's the, the name of the church is the Door, Christian, the, the Door Church. The Door Church now serves as a mother and grandmother church to more than 500 plus churches and over 42 foreign nations. Think about that. Paralyzed. Could have said why. Could have said it's not fair. Could have said it's too hard. Think about it. What if Pastor Warner would have drawn back? What if he would have allowed fear and anger to cloud his ability to press forward in Jesus. Thankfully, none of us here are faced with that type of an injury. But we all have things that we're battling. We all have things that we're struggling. And you know what? It's okay. I don't know all that God has for your life. But I do know this. The only way that you will ever know what God has purposed for your life is to fully is for you to fully surrender to His will. The only way you're going to ever know how God is going to use you is by surrendering to God's will. Don't hold back. Don't hold back in your walk with Christ. Don't be a halfway Christian. Don't look back on your life 10 years from now and say, man, I wish I really would have committed myself to what God wanted me to do. Don't allow the struggles and the trials and the difficulties of life to cloud and change your view of God. No matter what happens, no matter how difficult it gets, God is still the same. Amen? God is still the same. His promises are still true. His love is still true. And you know what? No matter what you're going through, no matter the struggle, you're just as saved today as the day that you gave your life to Jesus. But now, you have an opportunity to say, you know what, God? I'm going to press forward. When I'm weak, your strength is enough, Jesus. I'm going to walk in you. I'm going to trust in you. You know, tonight, I really felt that God wanted me to preach this. I've been, I've been dealing with some pretty heavy stuff with people, phone calls, crazy scenarios. And it has nothing to do with our church. <laughs> it has to do with people I've pastored, family members of mine that are reaching out to me for help, co-workers of mine that are going through difficult times. Do you know what it's made me really 
really begin to pray about and to consider, Jesus is enough. And He's good. And He loves us. And you know, tonight, I don't, I don't know what you're facing. But I encourage you to put your eyes and keep your eyes on Jesus. And He'll help you. Don't look at the wind and the waves. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And you'll walk in the miracle power of God. Amen? You'll overcome. God will help you. Let's bow our heads tonight. And so the next time the devil comes, and he's shooting them fiery darts at you, Ah, uh, not today, devil. I'm a child of God. I'm going to walk in victory. Not perfect, but God's okay with that, and I'm okay with that. Because I'm going to just take one more step forward. I'm going to get one, fur one step further away from that person I used to be, and one step closer to who Jesus wants me to be. And you'll just do that every day, man. You'll look back on your life 10, 12, 14, 15 years from now.